Today is an overview of uh, what's going to be in the course and uh, an overview of some of the basics of logistic regression modeling and some of the basics of epidemiology, I think, even where it fits in. Uh, we're going to spend about five weeks on talking about logistic regression. We're going to talk about regression diagnostics, which has to do with when you're doing a, a regression modeling procedure like logistic regression, how do you actually diagnose some of the problems that could result? For example, you try to run a model using a SAS proc logistic, which you've learned to, you learned to do last year, and the model doesn't run. What do you do? Uh, or how do you diagnose that problem? Or you have a lot of variables in the model, and, there, and there are, some of them are related to some others. How do you diagnose that problem? That, that's a problem of what's called collinearity. So that's one of the, that's a regression diagnostic problem. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, for, for, and there are some other issues that we're going to talk about. We're going to, we're going to spend at least uh, three or four weeks talking about survival analysis. And then the final part of the course is going to be on Poisson regression. All of these are different modeling techniques. They all have a lot in common, but they're all slightly different. So that's what we're going to do in the course. Uh, I think the TAs talk to you about what the, what the primary course materials are as far as textbooks are concerned. And the main two textbooks have my name on them. It also has Mitch Klein's name on. Mitch Klein is uh, a, uh, a faculty member in, uh, who has a joint appointment with epidemiology and environmental sciences. And so it's Klein, Baum, and Klein. Um, and um, these are the two main books. Uh, you can get them either at the, uh, by ordering them through um, Springer, the publisher, getting them on Amazon, or doing something at the bookstore, either, either one of these. And the books are also on closed reserve. There are some secondary books that we're going to give you some assignments to do. One is the book that you probably used last um, Spring, when you took the uh, the second the course on biostatistics that used the book by again had my name on it Kleinbaum, Cooper, Nizam, and Rosenberg. Okay, um, applied regression analysis. There's a bunch of chapters in there, particularly the ones on uh, Poisson regression. Um, there is an, a, 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 a book that was written a long time ago before most of you were born that you might want to look at because it's the ba it was one of the, the first books that was written about methodology and epidemiologic research, Climb on Cooper and Morgenstern. And then there's Active Epi Web that I think many of you already know about because you, you worked with it in, in Epi 530. And the last thing I, I should mention is that on the S drive, I have a library of papers about different methodology issues, uh, modeling issues that you could re refer to, and I might refer to some of those. Or Dr. R might refer to some of those as uh, we go through the course. Um, as you can already tell, or the lab instructors already, already the TAs already told you, we're going to record the lectures. Uh, the lab slides are on Blackboard, has all the materials for you to, to, to uh, work with. Um, there's a list of readings located in the additional materials folder on Blackboard. There are data sets for you to work with also on Blackboard. And there are some SAS programs that you're going to work with part of the SAS system. Um, if you have another package that you're more comfortable with, like anybody want to mention any? Stata, R, or as you're welcome to use it, even though we're not going to, we're going to mostly uh, illustrate our uh, data sets and our analyses through SAS. Um, there's homework. Um, that are not being collected, but it's very important that you do it. You do it as close to being on time as possible so that you're up to date with the course and you're ready when the exams are going to be, uh, are going to be given and, and taken. Uh, the grades are, be, are going to be determined by two midterms and an in-class and a take-home final. The take-home final is going to, uh, uh, going to involve a, a data set and a bunch of questions about the data set. It's going to be given out about a week before Thanksgiving. You can work in, you can work in groups of up to three people. Uh, it's a good idea to think about who those three people are going to be as soon as you can. And you might even think about working with that group uh, or you know, other people for, in doing the homework. It's always a good idea to work together. Um, primarily, we're going to use, uh, as I said, package programs, mostly SAS. Um, 
And um, that's all I want to say at this point, other than um, there are exams and, you know, how, how much they're going to be counting. They're important. Um, a couple of things more about exams is, um, is that when you take, there are three in-class exams, and when you take the in-class exams, you can bring in almost anything in the room because they're open book. But what you can't do is you can't bring laptops, tablets, cell phones uh, in, the, in the exam room. And you can't bring either hard copies or electronic copies of the primary course, uh, the primary textbooks in there. Actually, if you bring them in there, if you bring the hard copy or you, or you actually had the electronic textbook and you spent the whole time of the exam trying to look through it, you'd be wasting your time. You, sh you should have it together by the time of the midterm uh, in order not to have to do that. You, won't, you don't want to spend the time reading the book. You want to do that before, before that. Um, I've already said this about the take-home and the midterms. Um, you will be given practice exams before each of the in-class exams. You won't be given a practice take-home final. You'll be given the take-home final. And the practice exam will be, uh, the answers will also be given to you probably a couple of days after you get the exam. And in the lab sessions, the uh, TAs will go over the exam, the, the practice exam. So you're going to get practice. You can get, have an idea of what the exams look like. Um, uh, the TAs have already talked to you about what, what they're going to do in the lab, so I'm not going to say much more of that other than they're going to do a bunch of different things, review the lecture material, discuss the homework, and discuss computer issues, and so on. Now, this is the last thing I want to say about, uh, and then I'm going to let Eli, uh, Dr. R, take over here. Uh, in studying for this course, everybody's different. Everybody does it their own way, but there's an ideal way to do it depending upon how, where you are in the course is an ideal way, particularly if you're in the situation of the courses, you don't feel that sure of yourself in terms of your mathematical background or this course is another level up from what you had last year. And you want to make sure you get everything right. You want to do the right thing in order to be able to get a half decent grade in the course. Most of you will get a half decent grade or a lot better than a half decent grade. But the ideal way to study is before each class, you should look up or determine by looking at the syllabus what chapter in, the book, in what book is being covered and read that chapter so that when you go into class, you know something about what the, what the instructor is going to talk about. And you should even look at the, at the lecture notes that are on the lecture slide, that are in the lecture slide folder on, um, on Blackboard so that you're prepared for what's going to happen in the class so you're not coming in totally cold. If you go in totally cold, you're not going to get as much out of the class as if you go in prepared to some extent. Of course, you go in prepared, you might not understand everything, but at least you've got some kind of re toehold on, on how, to, how to start out. After each lecture class, you should review the lecture notes from the class. And maybe you're going you're gonna to make copies of the hard copies of the left le lecture notes and write some extra things in there. And also, you should re review that we're going to record the lectures, and you should ideally review the recording because you can then see and stop it and go back and forth and review anything that's being said that you want to try to clarify. Of course, the ideal way to study is also when you're doing all this and you have the lab on Wednesdays, to go into the lab and be willing to ask questions about what was covered in class. Not only let the lab instructor sort of lead you, but you help to lead the lab, lab instructor, on where, uh, uh, instructor on where you are. And as far as the homeworks are concerned, um, they're, again, they're very important. You should, I think you should consider working on the homeworks not by yourselves. Everybody's, you know, different, so some people might prefer to do that by themselves. But ideally, work in a small group. Uh, and try to do the homework assignment, start the homework assignment before, at least in the week before it's due, so you have a chance to work with it and think about it and, and, and so on, and um, finish the homework assignment by the time that the, it's going to be discussed in the lab. So if you do that and you do all this stuff and you do this in, a, in an ideal way, you can't miss getting a good, a, a good grade in the, in the course. If you don't and you get behind, and the midterm's coming up, and you haven't done it, hardly any of this stuff, you've just sort of been playing along as things, uh, as things go, then you might not do as well. So that's my uh, overall comments. One other thing before I let uh, Dr. R take over is, you notice this shirt? You notice, you may know that I'm known for my shirts. Some of you don't know that, because you haven't had me before. 
And so every, I'm not going to teach, um, I'm going to teach about half the classes or a little less than half the classes, but every class I'm going to wear a different shirt. And they're very colorful. They're not necessarily Hawaiian shirts, but they're colorful <laughs> shirts. Some of them will look like Hawaiian shirts. If for some reason I wear the same shirt twice and somebody catches me on that, the first one that catches me on it will get a shirt. <laughs> one of my old shirts. Got a lot of shirts. Okay. Okay. The last thing I'm going to say is, as a, a, as a sideline to my life, many of you may or may not know, and you may have seen this on Blackboard, because I already sent you this, I'm a jazz musician. I have a jazz band. It's a really good band. And the next time we're playing is a week from this Saturday. It's on Labor Day weekend. It's called the Moonlighters Jazz Band, where we, we, all of us have some other way to make a living we're not making our living on music, but it's a really good jazz band. We have a vocalist, we have a tap dancer. Whoa, how do you do that? Okay. I play the flute, we have flute, sax, guitar, piano, bass, drums, it's really a good band. And it's not expensive, it's cheaper than going to the movies, it's like six dollars, and it's at the Red Light Cafe, which is in Midtown, very close to here, so I'm just mentioning that. It's not required, obviously. Uh, and it won't affect your grade either way. It might if I see you there, who knows, but I doubt it, okay? So now it's time for Dr. R to take over. You did it, it was good. Okay, is this okay? Oh, it's too loud, that's too, that's too much. I, I am not in a jazz band. But I do other cool things, maybe, but not, not jazz. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, look at that. That's good. We look after each other. We're both goofy. So, just different. Oh, wow. This is so sensitive today. All right. So, we got a lot to talk about. Okay, first of all, what's this? Icebreaker. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I figure, you know, I figured before we start um, this year, you know, that, you know, we should just get to know each other a little bit. Um, so who, I, who am I? Who is this guy? So I just want to say a little bit about myself. I figure, you know, normally we just jump right into the course and that's cool and all, but then you're probably left wondering who are these weirdos teaching my course? And so I figured to say a minute about me before we jump into the, uh, the rest of the material. Is this too loud? Yeah. It's really loud. It's really. Oh. All right. All right, we're just going to do this. I'm not going to be jumping around as much. All right, so who is this guy? Who am I? So uh, this is my fourth year uh, uh, lecturing with FB740. I actually TA'd it for two years, uh, a few years before that, because I've been at Rollins for 11 years, which is crazy. It's like a long time. So I've seen 11 MPH classes come through here, which is pretty exciting. What do I do when I'm not up here uh, doing Epi methods uh, teaching? I do epi surveillance and modeling sort of methodological work. And I'd say modeling, when you, maybe when you signed up for this course, you might have gotten disappointed because you might have thought this was epidemic modeling or infectious disease modeling. And then you saw, like, what is all this regression stuff? And we'll talk about what all this regression stuff is about. Because in, ep in epidemiology, modeling can mean a lot of different things. And w something I spend time on is actual epidemic modeling, sort of infectious disease dynamics and epidemic modeling. So that's one sort of area I work on on the side. I work on HIV, STI, and hepatitis C prevention and surveillance, and we can talk, like, we have to do a whole other course just talking about those issues. And most recently, we're working on Zika epidemiology, which is really fascinating because we don't know anything, and that's just really exciting to work on something where we're all scared and don't know anything. Um, so, uh, and that's been really interesting and taken up a bunch of my time recently. Um, and when I do that, I hang out here. Does anyone know what this building is? Has anyone been to this building? This is CDC Puerto Rico, um, where, um, where there is, around which there is a ton of Zika right now. Um, and so we're all going crazy, about 35 cases in Miami. There is way more in Puerto Rico right now. Um, so, uh, and I'm gonna try to maybe infuse some of, the cool, some of the cool issues that are arising in Zika epidemiology, which really mixes a lot of um, 
and it mixes a lot of areas in maternal child health and infectious disease epidemiology into one big um, problem. Um, I'm also a real person. These are my these are my kids. They're really cute. It's a little. They're normally not this blurry. Uh, they're, they're, um, and this is the my five year old, and this is the one year old. Um, and maybe you'll see more pictures of kids and pajamas and food and, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, we try to keep things fun in this class. And my kid is 47 years old. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. two kids of our own. So anyway, this is just to convince you that outside of this course, we're real people with real, you know, do real things, hang out next to real palm trees and, and so forth. Um, there's actually also avocado trees on this campus of the CDC Puerto Rico. It's very neat. You just pick avocados. Um, so, uh, so today we're going to start um, this slide set. It's, it's, we're going to take longer than today. Um, but I'm going to sort of back it up and sort of talk about why, why are we here, what are we doing, what's epi research all about. Um, because if I would just jump sort of into this, the more statistically oriented material right away, you're just going to, you're going to be thinking, why are we doing this? Um, and so I want to sort of put this in context and really show that this is really the convergence of a lot of stuff that you've seen before. We really have sort of your epi coursework and your biostat coursework coming together um, in, in epi 740. And so I want to sort of spend some time with that. We'll talk about an example that we're going to use uh, for a few lectures, and we'll go into the logistic model, and then how we use that model to, one of the primary things we're going to be interested in for a while is the odds ratio, and so we'll talk about sort of how we use that model to estimate the odds ratio, which is a quantity you've seen before, so that hopefully won't be too new. Um, and so we're going to talk about um, some of the more uh, standard situations uh, with, in terms of the exposure variable and other variables uh, for estimating the odds ratio. Then we're going to sort of go into, okay, well, now you've got an odds ratio. Maybe you want to do something like a hypothesis test or a confidence interval. And so these last two pieces of the presentation are going to be about, well, how do we do statistical inference on the odds ratio with the logistic regression model? How do we actually say, make some conclusion, some sort of conclusive mathematical statements about uh, what we think is going on in our data. So that's, uh, that's sort of our, our outline here. Um, so I just wanted to really go back to sort of square one, which is really what, what is epi research all about, epidemiologic research. And really, I like to think of it as sort of uh, two and a half to three outer grouping, major groupings here, the last one's in parentheses. Right, so one thing that we like to do in, ep in, ep in epidemiologic research is just talk about the distribution of disease, right? That's the descriptive epidemiology and surveillance side. And here we're not necessarily, we're thinking, we're thinking about associations, you know, and we're looking at um, which groups are most impacted by some condition, typically. And that's sort of the descriptive epi side of, 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 of epi research. The other uh, side, which we often spend much more time thinking about in our coursework, and we will in this course as well, is really the determinants of disease. Um, what are the mechanisms um, uh, of sort of, what are the sort of the mechanisms of action in, in society or in, in the world that are, are putting some, you know, some groups at greater risk for a disease, um, health, or health outcome or behavior or what, what, what have you. Really sort of teasing apart complex relationships in the real world. And here we're really sort of thinking about causes and causality, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, and, and a lot of what we're going to focus on is really using models to understand um, the effects of exposures on disease. And that's really squarely in this sort of second category. There's another sort of something else that we don't talk about as much. Usually when we, in Epi 530, we just say it's distribu distribution and determinants of disease. There's sort of another one here where it's sort of some land somewhere in between, which is sort of prediction and classifying disease. If I know a bunch of things about you, can I predict whether you're going to have a heart attack? And that's sort of um, somewhere between causal and it's somewhere between the two of these. And we're going to revisit um, in a few weeks the logistic model and looking at how to use it as a predictive modeling tool to make uh, predictions based on covariates. Um, so we're going to come back to that during the ROC curves lecture. Um, so I'm going to come back to this in a moment. We're going to go just uh, over here just to orient our one slide after that. Um, so 
Right. Normally, in an epi research question or ep epidemiology, typical causal etiologic research setting, we want to understand sort of how three types of variables relate to each other. Right? There's a health outcome typically, and, and really in this course for a while we're going to be thinking about a binary health outcome, um, a zero one health outcome, alive or dead, um, cancer, no cancer, uh, things like that. Uh, and then we're going to think about exposures, which are really the primary, uh, you know, quantity variable of interest. Um, you know, that might be you know, living near the high tension wires, and and the outcome is cancer or whatever. Whatever your exposure, this is the major thing. This is why we, why the government paid you millions of dollars to go do a study. It's sort of about this. Um, along the way, we measure other stuff, right? And we measure other stuff for a variety of reasons. Um, and and uh, the general idea is we usually measure the other stuff because we want to control for them. There's other factors to take out to take into consideration, and these are the control factors. These are we're gonna, in this course we're going to call them C variables, variables that you measure to control for. So maybe the smokers live uh, near the high tension wires, and now the cancer risk of the people that live near the high tension lines might be also because they smoke more. So we need to start measuring smoking because that might be a confounder, which we'll talk about in a moment. So these are the sort of the types of the three major types of variables, and we're going to get more specific about our control variables because not all control variables are equal, and we're going to treat them differently in our analysis um, um, as we go on. We're going to introduce more letters and make it more alphabet soup, um, but but we're going to help. But we're going to guide you through the process. Um, so. This is the name of the game. And I just want to back it up here, and I'm going to just sort of talk about, I'm going to build towards why we do modeling uh, to, to look at these relationships. And I'm going to go, this is going back one slide. This is stuff you've sort of seen before condensed into one slide. It's sort of what is a cause? Right? And, and I think Dr. Howard's in her course spends a lot of time thinking about causality and causal inference and DAGs. Right? It was like a lot of that, right? And, um, so we're going to not we're not going to go into that into the depth and uh, in, into the into sort of weeks of exploring that as you sort of did in, in that course. We're going to do it like in a few slides, um, and I think it's just important to to think about how we define causality in epi because it di directly explains why we do what we do in our analyses. So. There's this really nice wordy long definition here, which is that X is a cause of Y if and only if Y would not have occurred had X not occurred. Okay, so that's that's the, the that's the long-winded um, sort of epi uh, sort of counterfactual definition of a cause. And basically, the idea was would would the outcome Y the X let's put this is the exposure would would Y the outcome have happened anyway um, had all factors had held equal. Um, if X had occurred or not occurred. Basically, it, the outcome, if the outcome was unaffected by the exposure, then, then um, it wasn't a cause. If somehow X changed the outcome, then we would say that um, it causes the outcome. So here's a, here's a real life example. Would someone with high blood pressure who gets a heart attack not have had the heart attack had their blood pressure been normal? Okay, and the, if the answer is yes, that means that the blood pressure was a cause of their heart attack, okay? So this is the idea that if you could sort of play reality twice on the same person, once with the exposure, once without the exposure, if something changes in their outcome, we say that the exposure caused the outcome. It's a really basic, just, you know, it's a very bland definition. We don't say how it changed it or how much it changed it or what, what, uh, and so forth. But if the outcome of a heart attack had changed, then we say that's a cause. Okay, this is the counterfactual definition of the cause. And it's really about focused, thinking about intervening or removing the exposure. And if you do that and the outcome changes, we say it was a cause. So the deal here is that this is sort of impossible, right? You can't actually do this. You can't actually see uh, one group or one person under two conditions. So you can't see them on, right? We only get to see people in their life one way. We can't actually expose the same person under, uh, you know, expose them and then see them unexposed and sort of measure their outcome twice, right? Um, we, would we would really like to do this. We would really like to have some time machine or a cloning device or something where we could do this to prove causality on the same person. Um, okay, this is an impossible situation, but if we could measure this situation, we would have measures of effect. 
And so everything else we do in epidemiology is to fake this. Right? We're, we're trying really, really hard to observe the counterfactual, and we can't. Um, we really would like to. So we're going to do a bunch of study design and analytical tricks to really sort of approximate this ideal universe where we can see everybody under two conditions. Um, so um, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to get back to this in a moment anyway. And this is um, jumping up. This is now I jumped onto the other side of the slide uh, that we were on here. Um, talk about confounding interaction and precision. We're going to get back to all this. Um, so, but we are going to talk about confounding, okay, which is the thing that, met, one of these things that sort of messes up our ability to understand causality. Um, so confounding is when you have a factor that's associated with both your exposure and your disease, and that essentially messes up the relationship that you observe between the exposure and disease, right, and that we might get um, different answers depending on whether we control for the, for the confounder or not, right. This is all... Um, Epi 530 and 534 stuff, that you have this thing that's associated with exposure and disease, and it messes up the answer, it distorts the answer. And that's fundamentally different than interaction or effect modification. And we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that more. Um, and so, we, you know, we need to, how do, we need to deal with, co these, with confounding, these external variables. Um, and the way that we, we deal with that is also through our study designs and our analyses. Um, and the idea here is the way we fix confounding, the way we sort of get rid of the fact that um, you have these other variables that are related to both exposure and disease is uh, through a, a number of techniques. Um, and the idea here, again, for all of this, is that we're, we're essentially simulating the counterfactual in our analyses. We're trying really, really hard to sort of balance the sample and fix things so that the exposure and the, that the confounder has, is sort of how unrelated to the exposure or the disease. Um, and so what we're going to do in our analyses, in all epi analyses, in all of our courses, what we do is we sort of use the experience of two groups, different people in two groups, not the same person under two conditions, different people in two groups to simulate the counterfactual experience of one group. Okay, so that's sort of a, a wordy thing, but right, it, I said originally we want to see the same woman under two conditions, you know, ideally, to prove causality. We're going to see the same person twice. We can't do that, we don't have a time machine, so instead we're going to sort of enroll in our study two different women and, and compare them. So we're, right, but we'd rather have had it the other way. We had one person, we could compare them twice. So this business of enrolling two groups where different people and comparing them in a fair way is really about um, simulating this other thing that we would rather have done, um, about w which is in see the same people twice. And every, uh, every analysis that we do is this. Um, it just it looks really, really different, but every analysis down to the modeling we do is essentially getting at the same idea. Um, so here's, I'm gonna start with sheep, and we're gonna wind up with humans to sort of show like why, why this works and what we're, what we're talking about. So, um, you know, in, a, in the, Ideal study, the ideal sort of research study based on this definition of the counterfactual that we talked about, the ideal study is a study of clones. Because if you have clones, you can just essentially do something like this, where let's say you had, um, here's, these are Dolly, this is Dolly the sheep, by the way, so, or a clone who has actually long, long died, though actually, did anyone hear the NPR story about, about Dolly a few weeks ago? There's siblings of Dolly. They keep making new Dollies from the same um, from the same uh, fertilized egg. So they could, it's, it's crazy. So there's still like siblings of Dolly, and they, they, they still live and die, and it's really interesting. Um, so you actually could you could sort of do this experiment um, if you had access to that lab or something. So um, so the basic idea here is you know in the ideal study you'd have a bunch of clones. You know, and they, let's say there's four and four. Half, you give half of them the exposure and half of them don't. And then, and we look something like this. Here's my little animation. We get, there we go. This is our study. We ran our study. You gave the placebo, draw, or the placebo, it's the, placebo's the wrong thing. You gave, you gave one exposure to Dolly and one Dolly dies or gets, in, I don't know what, what this condition is, upside down syndrome. Um, and... And on this, in this, in the exposed group, three get upside down syndrome. Um, so in this study, if we did it, they're all the same subject, we're really, really sure 
that exposure this exposure causes three times the condition than this one. We're so, so sure. The reason we're so sure is because it's all the same sheep, and it happened, there's only eight of them, and three of them go hoof up, um, and this is what happens. And this, we're very sure, and the reason we feel confident is because we know they're all the same exact animal. Um, we can't do this with humans, right? So what we do are things that try to get close to this situation in our studies. So you can't actually do this in humans, or we, we don't clone people. Uh, we do things like twin studies, right, which is a, maybe sort of the closest thing you can do to this for, for uh, humans. And um, the basic idea here is if you have a twin study, right, you, you're within a given pair, which we're gonna, we can call a matched pair, right, you're sort of looking at, uh, you're controlling for a lot, right? You're controlling it as the same genetics, the same environment, more or less. Um, it's hard to do these, we can't often do twin studies for the things we care about, but think about a twin study. If you had a study where you enrolled three, you know, or more sets of identical twins, um, you're sort of getting close to the sheep situation. Because if you think about it, what if you, what if you gave half, unex, you know, half were unexposed, that's the right here, and the other, the other half were exposed. Well, the groups sort of have the same mix of confounders, right, on average, right? So the, you know, the um, sex distribution on the left is the same as the sex distribution on the right, right? It's split down the middle, and the groups, group-wise, it's sort of balanced, right? And so that's a good thing, right, from when we talk about controlling for confounders. Because when you do a study, a twin study like this, and you give one half an exposure and the other half on exposure and the other, the other treatment or whatever it is, uh, you're essentially creating two groups um, where the confounder distribution is balanced. Right? Balancing the confounder distribution in the two groups means that the exposure and the confounder are not associated. And if you remember back to the previous semesters and, and da the DAGs, right, that, that triangular, the simple DAG, you're breaking the association between exposure and the confounder and you're not going to have confounding anymore. Um, and so twin studies are really cool because they're a really great way to balance these confounders between the exposed and unexposed groups, and you're sort of controlling for all sorts of stuff uh, in one fell swoop. Are we on, on, on board? Why is this a good idea? If you can do a twin study, do it. We usually can't do it. Um, but this is sort of going towards why we like to do what we do in most epi studies, analytically. Um, Right, oh, this is the last bullet that we said here. When we look at sort of group-wise, this group on the left is very similar to the group on the right, except they differ on exposure, and that's it, right, in theory. Obviously, if you have an identical twin, I probably just insulted you because you probably think you're very different from your twin. But in general, we're talking about controlling for a lot uh, at the same time here. And this is really what we would love to do in our epi studies. It's sort of arranged for group-wise clones, in a sense. Group exposed is sort of like the unexposed, except for the exposure. All right, that, we, we can't really do that, right? So what do we try to do in epi research? We try to do some other stuff. Um, we, do, we, we throw designs and methods that try to simulate that twin study. Okay, and the whole point is about balancing the confounders between the exposed and unexposed groups. Okay, that's all we're trying to do in stratified analysis and in modeling. Um, it's what we try to do in randomized control trials. So that in, right, in experimental randomized research, um, the whole idea here is by randomly assigning exposure, right, in, an, in an RCT, we randomly give out the exposure or the drug or whatever you want to call it. The idea here is that when you look at the exposed and unexposed group after you randomly hand out exposure, the confounder distribution is supposed to be the same, right? That's a way of sort of, sh you, shuffle, you shuffle your study subjects around, and after you do this in a randomized trial, after you hand out the exposure at random, you've actually created more or less similarly comparable groups in terms of their confounders. So this is one way to do it, right, is you do a randomized control trial for whatever your, your issue is. The problem is, in epi, many of our issues are not solved by randomized control trials, right? We don't... We can't, it's either unethical or completely infeasible to, um, to do a randomized experiment. I can't hand out Zika. Um, you know, you can't do, hand out all sorts of nasty things that we like to study um, in epidemiology. And so, or we don't have time to wait around 
for, an, for a two-year RCT or whatever, whatever the logistical issue is, is usually not possible. So often we do observational studies, right? And that's what we're really going to be talking in this course really about observational data, right? And this is, this is you get the data that you get and you're going to try to discover truth in it. Um, and what we're trying to do with the data that we, that we obtain is really understand that exposure disease relationship while controlling for these extra variables. Um, and the idea here is with the observational studies, we're going to manipulate through analyses essentially to sort of create sets of clones so that we can compare them. Um, and we're going to sort of try to simulate the, the twin studies um, in a sense. Um, using mathematical techniques that try to balance the confounders. So that's the whole idea. That's all we're ever trying to do is in most of your courses, in epi courses, you're really down here, is trying to manipulate the data through analyses that essentially are trying to make the exposed and unexposed as, as clean of a comparison as you can. Um, so here's my pictorial way of which we do this. So randomization, as we talked about, essentially is about balancing, you sort of, at random, hand out exposure and random exposure such that, on average, the uh, confounding variables are balanced between the, 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 the exposed and unexposed groups. That's randomization. In, in 530, I'm sure you talked about restriction, right? This is the most sort of basic technique in observational data. That's just sort of, you, only, you do your analysis on a very narrow sort of slice of the, of the population, right? You, I'm only going to enroll my study where it's females uh, of reproductive age that live in this town who go to that coffee shop or whatever it is. It's going to be very restricted. And the reason you try to do this is that in that group, they're sort of comparable. You're trying to balance the confounders by restricting the data the by the design or you're restricting the analysis to some stratum that is more or less comparable. And so restriction is one technique that we do where we say, look, we're going to only look at this demographic group. We're only going to we're gonna balance the confounders by making them all have the same confounders, essentially. You're sort of getting rid of those. If everyone in your study is female, well, then female can't be a confounder. That's the idea with restriction. Stratification is, is sort of lots of restriction. In stratified analysis, which you worked through with Dr. Christensen in last spring, it was about just doing lots and lots of restrictions. It was like, we're going to analyze uh, the stratum that's just the females of reproductive age as one group. And then we're going to combine that with another analysis where we just took the odds ratio of the male, elderly males in another, in another stratum. And you sort of did lots and lots of restriction and kept balancing the confounders in those groups. And then you sort of smushed it all to together. Right? What's the, does anyone remember what's the analysis where you sort of smush it all together? It's very technical. Two, two people, they're hyphenated. Eh, Mantle, Hansel, Mantle, Hansel. Right? That analysis was, was, was this, right? Where you, you do this restriction many times. You say, like, well, we're just going to analyze each stratum on its own. And then we're going to sort of compress all the information together into a single summary odds ratio. That's what the Mantle, Hansel procedure was. It was lots and lots of restriction. We call it stratification. All right, but the name of the game is within each stratum, you're balancing the confounders because it, you know, there is, there, essentially you're eliminating confounding in each stratum and then you sort of combine all of the information. Okay, matching is a very similar sort of idea where you sort of arrange strata in the design of the study. You're sort of saying, we're going to control, we're going to sort of make strata that look, we're going to arrange pairs, we're going to have households, whatever the, some clustering factor is, we're going to enroll people in our study as a unit, and that unit has all the same confounders. That's, the, that's matching. We're going to talk about matching a lot more. Um, and this is also something you've seen before. But I'm just trying to convey these are all sort of variations on a theme. The whole idea is balance. Um, standardization is um, essentially manipulating the distribution of confounders between two groups so you can compare them. And that's the indirect and direct standardization measures are weighting the data and you're essentially playing God to make weights and make two populations comparable on their confounders. So that they're sort of illustrated like this. Standardization is really uh, very useful. I use it all the time. Love standardization. Okay. But we're here to talk about statistical modeling. And statistical modeling um, 
is essentially, first of all, can be combined with many or any of these um, above procedures. And it's really, um, let's, it's another sort of manipulating technique where we fit a model that describes the data. We fit a statistical model that describes the data. And then we manipulate the confounders. We, we play God again. We sort of, we manipulate the confounders that let us make a clean comparison of the exposed and unexposed. Okay, so we're going to fit a model where we say we think this model describes the data and then we're going to manipulate things to make this comparison. It's very similar to standardization in that respect um, and it's really uh, similar to all of these. And it's really just another technique. It's not, you can't summarize it cleanly in a nice table or there's not going to be as much two by two tables or any of that in the statistical modeling. But the name of the day game is really fitting this thing that describes the data, making this sort of clean, balanced comparison. It's all the same. Are we convinced it's all the same? Eh, okay. I, this is just like breeze through a year of work in like 15 slides. But the point is, we're really just like another square on the board in the march towards um, epidemiologic understanding or something. So this is really all just another piece of the puzzle. Um, so we're going to start with an example uh, for a, a MRSA example, MRSA, methicillin methicillin-resistant Staph aureus infections. So um, this is the data set that we're talking about. And the data set, um, uh, I'll introduce on the next slide. But uh, MRSA is a, uh, a nasty uh, infection. <laughs> um, it's, resist it's a bacterial infection that's resistant to methicillin, an antibiotic. Um, it sort of comes in two flavors, uh, healthcare-associated and community-associated uh, um, varieties, healthcare associated, are ones that are acquired in hospital settings. Um, and it's uh, res responsible for significant um, morbidity and mortality in the US. It's a, you know, anti antibiotic resistant bugs are uh, hard to get rid of because they're resistant to antibiotics. Um, so we're going to deal with sort of one example here. Uh, it's from this wonderful building, um, which I'm sure you, you've at least driven by. Um, this is Grady Memorial Hospital, part of the Emory or Emory Grady sort of healthcare universe. Um, and uh, so this is a data set uh, of uh, 297 patients who all have staph infections. Everyone has an infection. And the, the question is whether their infection is resistant to antibiotics. So some are going to be susceptible to antibiotics and some won't. Some are going to be MRSA. They're going to be uh, methicillin resistant. And so, uh, so some of these 297 are going to be resistant, some are not. And that's the outcome of interest. So we want to know whether uh, these folks um, at admission have a resistant infection. And we measured some other variables of interest. One is whether they had a previous hospitalization, yes or no, binary variable. Uh, another variable that we might have measured is their age. That's a good one to usually measure. Uh, their sex, zero for female, one for male. And then another variable is whether they've sort of been previ or previously, let's, within some time period, let's say within, within 90 days or whatever it is, um, they were administered um, antibiotics, antimicrobial drugs, another binary variable, one or a zero. Okay, so we've got four variables here that were sort of the predictors. This one, this previous hospitalization is going to be sort of the main exposure. We want to know whether previous hospitalization is, re is, is associated with having a resistant infection at admission. Okay, so that's sort of the main research question. Um, and you might, I, you might make something that looks like this. Here's our, our, our 290, here's 292 people in this analysis. Um, I promise no two by two tables, but eventually we're starting with two by two tables. Um, and so here's sort of the crude data. This is the basic exposure disease relationship. Okay, we have a um, hundred, uh, uh, is there 115 of the infections were resistant, you know, and of which those, let's say 103 um, of those individuals were previously hospitalized. Here's the data layout. You do this workup, you compute uh, an odds ratio, and lo and behold, the, um, the uh, odds ratio is 11.7. So that's like a really strongly positive relationship, right? Um, Okay, so we say, and, and here is, here you can apply wearing your Epi 534 hat, you can apply skills you learned last semester on this two by two table and conclude, here's its confidence interval six to 23. 
uh, 95% confidence interval. Uh, and here we have a, a, a large chi-square uh, with one degree of freedom test of 65. Wow, that's a really big test statistic. Um, with a p, it's a p-value that's very small. You would reject this, the null hypothesis of no association, and you would say, yeah, there's a really big association. Okay, this is what you would do uh, last semester. Um, but the question is, is that, you know, are we done? Are we done? We're not done. No, we measured all this other stuff. There's something else going on. Let's take a look. Um, if we're done, that, then, then our, our jobs aren't interesting. Um, so naively, just looking at this exposure disease relationship, we see 11.7. OK, here's some, more, here's some more stuff. Here's some stratified analyses, OK, using the MH adjusted odds ratio. What's MH? Look at that, between the first time and the second time. That was, that was great. <laughs> um, so great, OK, so the Mandel Hansel test, right? So what's going on here, this is the summary of a lot of analyses sort of on, in one table. And every row here, we've got um, essentially the outcome of a different stratified analysis. This one is the original two by two table. This one is when we sort of stratified on age. Age was, I think, dichotomized for this. And we sort of t looked at a summary odds ratio across uh, multiple strata of age, across sex, and so forth. Here are strata. When we stratify simultaneously on age and sex, we're making a lot of tables now, um, and you summarize uh, an odds ratio from age and sex stratified at the same time, you get, 11, you get this result, 11.59, so forth. So here's a lot of different stuff going on. Here, this last row is an analysis where we simultaneously stratify on age, sex, and previous uh, antimicrobial use. So a lot of, a lot of cells. And what, what, do you, what you see here is, looks pretty different. Okay, once we start controlling for certain variables, the answer changes. All right, the answer changes substantially. You went from 11.7, which really you should never believe an odds ratio of 11.7. If you see it, don't believe it, scrutinize it. That's a really strong association. Um, it doesn't usually happen. Um, so, uh, and once you start controlling for stuff, you, you, suddenly we see uh, a pattern here that where we, you, once you control for everything, it's on a 4.66 is the odds ratio. Okay, so that's one, ob that's one, one observation here. Does everyone, does anyone remember what, what, what does BDP value stand for? All right, good. The other hyphenated one, Breslow Day. Uh, and this is, this is the test of interaction, right? And so this is, these are all sort of not significant, right, which are sort of telling us that the odds ratio, um, that we, we, we don't believe that the odds ratio is varying across the strata, okay? That there's really essentially one odds ratio, and it's not being modified by these other factors that we're stratifying on. So that's good. Um, but what's, do you see a, a pattern here? What, what's the variable that we need to control for? Or, need, or once you control for it, things sort of move a lot. Right, the drug use. Okay, the previous antimicrobial use, exactly. So it seems that control for age and sex doesn't really alter things much. But once we control for previous antimicrobial use, that seems to be meaningful uh, in the analysis. And we suddenly see odds ratios around five or you know, 4.66. Okay, this is sort of the intuition. We're going to be using this intuition a lot in this course. Okay, when what what do you generally suspect when you see a, a variable that once you control for it, it changes your effect estimate? Confounder. Right? We usually think, oh, that might mean it's a confounder, right? We have rules like the 10% rule. Like if it moves by more than 10%, then we suspect uh, confounding is at play. And conversely. We might look at age and sex and be like, mm, you know, I don't really know if we had a control for that. We didn't really get much out of it, right? We control for age, and we sort of have the same point estimate. Um, another thing you might observe is, well, maybe, you know, maybe if I control for age, I'll get a better confidence interval or a more significant p-value, right? Some of your, you might have this intuition, particularly we see this in linear regression sometimes when you control for factors you are able to reduce the mean squared error and get a more significant test. So you might sort of use your linear regression thinking and say, well, maybe if I control for age, it helps on my precision. I get a narrower confidence interval. You might, you know, I look at this and say, hmm, maybe a little bit, uh, but 
No, not, not actually, no, not, not really. We, see, we, we get a slightly lower upper bound, but then this bound moves lower. So we don't really get much out of controlling for age. Right? We get the same estimate, the same confidence interval, and you might say, well, all right, well, one of my recommendations in my paper is you don't need to measure age when you do this kind of work. You know, when you're looking, when you does it, it's on it, when we understand the association between uh, um, hospitalization and uh, resistance uh, infection, it, it sort of doesn't matter whether you control for age. And so what we're going to spend a lot of time doing is figuring out, well, what control variables do we control for? Who cares? Maybe, you know, maybe at the end of the day, we're going to look at all these results and process them. And, we're, and, and this guy is going to talk about how to process all this. Um, and we might just do, we might do this analysis to conclude, well, age and sex don't matter. Uh, and uh, we're just going to look at pre previous antimicrobial use. And that's the thing to think about. And then we're going to summarize the results. So there's a lot, there's a lot in this there's a lot in here to sort of work through this. And we're going to not use stratified analysis when we do this. We're going to use regression modeling. But we're going to do a similar sort of idea where we're going to sift through a lot of results and figure out what's the best result. Um, best is in quotes because there's a sort of a subjectivity to it. Um, and so there's, a, uh, there's, there's sort of more objective ways through this. And there's some, a few subjective calls that we're going to have to make along the way as well. Um, and you're going to talk about why it's an art or not an art. Um, and so this, this is an art and it's a science, and we're going to we're going to all do it together. Okay. So um, yeah. yeah. Talk about, go back and sure. What's that? There's double stars. Yes. You want to talk about the double stars? Star? <coughs> yes. You want to say something about why they're there? Sure. Right. We're going to we're going to actually go that on the limits of stratified analysis in two slides, but we can talk about it now. So so the deal. <laughs> So, so one of the issues of stratified analysis, right, and this definitely came up in 534, is that when you sort of get into this mode of dicing up your data into strata in stratified analysis, you can sort of quickly run out of data, right? Because you start, you, you start with 292, and then now you, you split two ways for sex, and then another two ways for age, and, two, you know, and now you have eight tables, and maybe you have zero cells, right? You start running out of data pretty quickly. Um, and so these rows are rows where we sort of ran out of data. Um, and so they sort of put a little correction factor, a little factor to fake some data in a cell in order to let us make the computation possible. That's sort of fake, right? We're not, if you have a zero cell and you put a 0.5 in there, that you're making it up now. And so this is sort of one of the limits of stratified analysis. And so we're going to, this, this course is about a better way. Um, and that's the, the modeling approach. Is that where you were going? Where he's going? See, he's been doing this for like 100 years. So, you know, and I, four. So, you know, this is what, this is what happens. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, so what, we raised a lot of issues here, right? Which, how do we think about which variables to control for? What are the real confounders? What are real, what are the true effect modifiers? Um, and we're, I, we've said a lot of this already here, you know. Um, but really, how do we sort of sift through complex results to sort of make more definitive statements about what, what all the variables mean with relation to one another? Um, and then really, at the end of the day, what's the right answer? What's the right answer for the exposure disease relationship? Um, how, how, you know, is, can, we make, can we make the best uh, confidence interval possible, and best being narrow? Um, and, you know, can we do a, a good, uh, can we, can we make a strong statistical statement about the association? So that's sort of what we're trying to do. And we got to first sift through all these other variables and figure out what's what. We measured, we measured 30 things in our questionnaire, and we're just trying to get truth at the end. How do we sift through all this? OK. So the problem is that stratified analysis has limits, as we just talked about. right? So one thing is that all the predictors had to be categorized. That's annoying. Um, right? We measured age as a continuous thing. That's sort of annoying. Um, and then we also had these issues of sparse data. Zero cells um, is just sort of annoying. And the other thing is that when you three-way stratify for age, sex, previous antimicrobial use, that's sort of overkill. You're sort of allowing the detection of a three-way interaction when you do that. You're allowing, it's a very, we'll, 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 we'll talk more about this in, in, a, in a little bit. But this is sort of overkill to sort of break out by all possible combinations in a stratified analysis. You don't necessarily, yes, question.
That is, let's think. Um, the Mantle-Hansel test. Yes. That's a great, so that's a great question. So this, so in the, I wonder if it was just in the, that's a good question. This may have been a different, this confidence interval may be reflecting a different procedure. That, that's a really good point. So not, so there, I don't actually have the answer for that. The manual handle test, does, the test does not require any 0.5 right. test. Though. This may have just been a if subject. If you want to get the odds ratio when you've got zero cells, then you have to worry about that. Because if and, you try to compute an odds ratio for a two by two table, which is from stratified on, and there's a zero cell in it, right. you can't get it. And the other one so is the Breslau day. Four point six six. There, you'd have to do something. Well, within the straight. The other thing is, you need to have. So there's. I don't remember whether how Dr. Christensen does this in her course. Does she talk about the different types of sparse data? A little bit. Case, did you call it type one or case one two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So. The Mantle Hansel lets you get a summary statistic across all the data, but you can't say much about a given stratum. The Breslow Day test uh, requires you to have sufficient data in each stratum. So, for example, without this correction factor, you couldn't compute the Breslow Day test. That's one piece. Um, but the other thing is you sort of might not like zero cells for computation of the odds ratio in a given stratum, and other procedures that aren't the Mantle Hansel require this. But good question. Good memory. You. You read up after the summer. Um, <laughs> very good. I guess they're um, done. They're, they're done. done. They're done. That's, right. That's a little more. All right. So I want to just sort of go into quick. We got we to wind up here talking about the logistic model, okay? And so the logistic model is a, is really a specific statistical re, sort of regression model that's really looks a lot like others. Once you sort of there, it's, it's just one of many types, right? And the name of the game of all of the statistical models, linear regression, logistic regression, survival analysis, and so forth, is you're taking a function of a bunch of X thing, variables that you measured in the world, sex, age, antimicrobial use, and you're related in your, you're, you're sort of feeding your data into this function, and you, you think that it is predicting, uh, it's describing this function is sort of outputting uh, an estimate of your outcome, right? You're relating your x's to your y's by some function. Right? And for us, it's going to be the logistic function. Um, and of course, this is the real world, and you're never going to exactly describe your outcome perfectly. There's usually some error, right? You're not going to exactly nail it um, all the time. There's going to, you're not going to have some distance between your estimate and the, and the actual uh, truth that's observed. Right, and then another way to express this above model is with expected values is that on average, um, on average, the expected value of your y is described, the average value of your y is described well by this function. Okay, this is sort of, uh, you know, by a statistical uh, way of thinking about it, that on average we're um, describing our, our outcome with our, by this function of our data. Okay, so in a binary, when you're, uh, exposure is is binary, zeros and ones. You know we're just measuring a binary. Uh, I'm sorry, exposure outcome. When your outcome is binary, zeros and ones, then uh, the average. It turns out a few things. First of all, the average, the expected value of the of y, of when it's all zeros and ones, is the probability uh, or the proportion with that outcome in the population. Right. So if you have 60 out of 100 people have a one. Well, it, then 0.6 is the proportion that have a one, right? Does that, that make sense, right? Just the data is just zeros and ones. And so what's interesting about in this, in, when our data, when we have a binary outcome, is that really we're describing the probability of the outcome in the population, right? Lots, just, all, just zeros and ones. You got 100 people, 60 of them have disease. 0.6 is the proportion that have disease. So that's just one, like, thing that we're doing. In the world, we're measuring zeros and ones, who has cancer, who doesn't have cancer, and we want to know the proportion that have cancer. Same idea, but one's the data and one's what the model's telling us. So just one thing to keep in mind is that we're, we're sort of flipping between zeros and ones and proportions. Okay, that's cool. So then, um, 
That means that if the expected value of y is the same as sort of the probability or the proportion, which I'm using them sort of interchangeably here, um, then, the, then this function for a binary situation, this expected value of y function giving the x's is the same as uh, a function that models the probability of y. Okay, so when we're doing regression, on logistic regression and binary data, we're actually modeling not just y, but the probability of y. Okay, that's because we care about the proportion um, or the, the, the likelihood of getting uh, an, an outcome, okay? So when we do things in epidemiology, we're gonna express this statistical sort of function very specifically as the expected value of disease. Our Y variable is gonna be our D variable, our disease outcome. Given some, our, we're gonna call at least one of our X's usually an exposure. We're gonna talk about more exposures later. Um, but we're going to start with at least one exp with one exposure, and then some stuff we control for, some control variables. Okay, and these could be uh, really complex. These can be products of other variables, quadratic terms, all sorts of interesting things. Um, and this is what we're talking about in epidemiology. Y becomes D, and at least one of the X's is exposure. Okay, and in this course, we're going to talk about really a whole bunch of different uh, models. We're going to talk about all these types of models in the course. Not as much linear regression, because you already had a year of linear regression. You don't need to hear any more about it. Um, but we're going to really start off here on the logistic model, which deals with an outcome, a Y variable or a D variable for, uh, that's binary. But we're going to get more complicated. Right? We're going to extend this to two other types of logistic models. We're going to talk about, uh, well, what if the outcome doesn't necessarily have two levels. What if it has three, five, eight, whatever, whatever you have? We're gonna look at uh, when the ad outcome is totally categorical beyond two levels. That's gonna be called, it's an, or a nominal is one way, one type of that is gonna be a polynomous logistic regression. Right? A nominal categorical variable is when there's sort of no natural ordering, you know, um, so tumor, you know, tumor type might be, uh, you know, you have different sort of just uh, ideologic classifications of a tumor. There's no ordered no ordinality to it. Or color, you know, red, green, blue is a nominal categorical variable. That's going to be another type of outcome that we're going to deal with with polytomous uh, logistic regression. It's also called multinomial uh, logistic regression. Another type of thing we're going to deal with is ordinal data. When you have data that has some pattern to it, but it's not really continuous, you know, like stroke severity or any severity scale where it goes one, two, three, and th you know, two is worse than one and three is worse than two, so, but it's not continuous. There's only three levels to it. You, you know, that's not, to model that with linear regression would be a bad idea. You would get your paper rejected. Um, so, uh, so instead we're gonna teach you ordinal logistic regression and your paper will be happily accepted. So, uh, and you're gonna write us a thank you note. Um, so we're gonna talk about that and then we're gonna talk about survival analysis. Okay, this is a different type of, uh, again, same type of statistical modeling stuff, but we're gonna talk about time to event. Um, so days until, you know, days until uh, someone inquires a sexually transmitted infection. It's when the outcome is really sort of, it's a binary thing that happens, getting an infection, but we're really interested in the time process, how fast something happens. Uh, and so that's survival analysis, okay? How long until something good or bad happens? So just yes, survival's a good thing. We're gonna also talk about bad things that happen. Um, so we, could, we can go either way on this. Um, and the last one is Poisson regression, which is really about uh, modeling count data. Um, and so count data is a special type of data where it doesn't usually get lower than zero. You can't go count negative uh, on health outcomes. Um, and, uh, and it has no upper bound. And that's gonna be Poisson regression, which is the last part of the course. So here's an example of deaths per county. That's a count data. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna talk about these, these sort of get interrelated. Poisson is sort of has aspects of survival. It has aspects that are similar to logistic regression. Um, and so we're gonna talk about all this. Okay, what's the logistic function? Okay, here's, so the logistic function, not logistic regression, is anything that looks like, sort of like this. It has y equals one over y plus e to the minus x, okay? This is the function, you, you, you know, and they all look something like this. They're sigmoidal, they're S-shaped, okay? They all look like this. And the, the, the idea here is that if you manipulate what's in this exponent, you distort the shape of the S. That's the idea, okay? So here's one where it's 
Net, it's, uh, it's, uh, my, it's e to the minus x plus five. So there's a plus five up here. And it, this is that logistic function. And if you do two x plus five, you're gonna get a different one. And if you keep sort of playing around, you're gonna get these different s-shaped functions. Okay, and what's cool about them is they're bounded from zero to one. Okay, zero to one, there it is. It sort of asymptotically approaches zero and one. And this is a very convenient function uh, for describing binary data. Because I, I imagine if you had some toxin, I don't know, let's imagine this. The more, and let's say one is death, is your outcome. If I increase your toxin to 10, looks like you're gonna die. Um, and if I give you zero toxin, looks like you're not gonna die, or whatever it is. You know, so imagine if, that, if I had a single analysis where zero to 10 was the amount of toxin I give you. Um, you might describe the probability that you're gonna die with this function. Now this is a you know, simplistic example, we're hopefully not poisoning you, um, but the idea here is it sort of gives you a way to describe how you get from zero to one in a nice continuous way. And as we give you more exposure variables, it's gonna get more complicated. Um, but the idea here is that it's, it's, a, it's a function that's very useful for describing zero and one data. Okay, so that's the logistic function. But we're, we want a logistic regression model. And the idea here is we're gonna go, we're gonna say, we're gonna find the right x for your data. That's the name of the game. You got a lot of data, you got a lot of variables. We're gonna find the right thing to put in for this x that describes your data really well. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna say not only is it x, but it's a whole collection of things in here. Okay, and it's a whole collection of things that's represented by the data that you measured in your study. All right, so we got um, X1, X2, X3, all sorts of things you measured, age, sex, previous antimicrobial use, what, you know, where in Atlanta you lived, what kind of car you drive, whatever data is important. And we're gonna essentially find a model to put in that X so that we can find the right function to fit to your, to your outcome. Okay, and so um, in this model we're, we're measuring subjects, and we're measuring up to k predictors, and we're getting a response on everybody, a zero or one response. And uh, down in here is something that sort of looks like the linear regression model. And we're gonna talk about how you get the linear regression, how this sort of is much like the linear regression model. And the idea here is we're gonna, we're gonna use um, the maximum likelihood estimation inside of proc logistic, and we're gonna find the right magic values of alpha and beta, the right, the optimal values of these, of these terms, alpha and beta, that in conjunction with the data, x1, x2, and so forth, best fit your data. We are trying to find the most, the, the best values of these, of these uh, alpha and beta terms, this is the intercept, the alpha, um, and then these are our slopes, or, or um, beta values, and we're gonna find the, the values that optimally match, uh, that opti optimally describe the data when we're trying, and this is gonna uh, describe the probability of y equals one given all your x's, which we're gonna abbreviate as p of x. But this is the prob this thing describes the probability of having your outcome, right? Here's, this scale is the probability, somewhere between zero and one, your probability of death, life, cancer, whatever it is, um, is gonna be described by this function that we're gonna fit our data to, okay? And we're gonna do a lot of different, we're gonna do a lot of different things with it. So the first thing that we're gonna do, uh, one set of things you can do is use this model just as it is, and we can use it to predict the risk for um, having a uh, health outcome of interest. So the, the y, the, the, our y equals one. Because if you knew what this function looked like for a given, health situation and you had, and you brought this model values of all the X's for sex, age, and so forth, you could use, this is essentially your crystal ball and you can make a prediction of the health outcome because it will spit out 0.8. And now you're gonna say congratulations, your chance of having the health outcome is 0.8. So this is useful for making predictions. We're gonna talk about ROC curves and there's something else called propensity scores which are used um, in certain advanced epi analyses which are gonna all use this format of the model. Well, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about something else that we can do. Okay, and that's gonna be using this model to look at measures of effect or measures of association. 
all right, the odds ratio, the risk ratio, and the prevalence ratio. That's going to require a slightly different version of the model, and, we'll, and I'll show that in a moment. So there's sort of two things you can do. You can use this model and predict the probability right away, plug in your, plug in your data, plug in output from SAS, and you get uh, estimates of, of this, uh, of, the pro of, the, of the risk or the probability of an outcome. Uh, or we're going to use a different version of the model to look at these ratio measures. Okay? And we're going to do it like this. I'm going to run through this very quickly. It's going to be a lot of Greek and algebra, and so and this all you've seen it all before, so review at home. But I just want to get to the bottom, which is the alter of this slide, which is the alternative version of the model. If this is the prob if this is the probability form of the model, this is the, the original logistic model that we care about, one minus it looks can be expressed like this. Here's a really fancy way of writing one, right? This here, I've just decided to put something over the same thing. It's always equal to one. And with this, what I put over the same thing is the denominator of the, probab the probability form of the model. If you write one minus the probability form of the model like this, the ones cancel out on the numerators here, and you get this, right? It, it's, this is a really weird way of writing one, but let's just say we did it. Same thing over the, over the same thing, okay? Then the, this one over here cancels out with this one over here, and there you have it. I'm going to now write something else. I'm going to say the odds of disease. The odds of disease is the probability over 1 minus the probability. That's just, that's what it is. That's the odds. We talked about it last year. And this is the odds of disease. Using these two functions above, p of x and 1 minus p of x, as in terms of the logistic model, you can actually write a new way of the odds by substituting these pieces into here. So, take all the stuff above and write it as this ratio, p of x over 1 minus p of x. Lots of stuff cancels, these denominators cancel. And what you're left is e to the alpha plus beta 1, x1, and so forth is the odds in terms of the regression model. Okay, so this all works out, I promise, um, and it's, it's worth spending time with. So, this is the odds form of the model. This is still sort of ugly. I'm going to take the log of both sides. You take the log of this thing, this is going to essentially uh, uh, bring down, the E goes away and you bring down what's in the exponent here, and the log of the odds is this linear regression-like model. Okay, this is called the logit form of the model. Okay, so another way to talk about the same information is through this log of the odds, which is a more linear, user-friendly looking sort of thing. Um, that's the log odds or the logit of the model here. Okay, so this is a much more convenient form of the model, and we're going to use it to do things like compute the odds ratio, all right, which is a measure of association that's really useful in all of our epi designs. Okay, so the basic idea is here, there is, um, for the same situation, where we're trying to predict the probability based on some x's, we have a general form of the model and then a logit log odds form of the model. This goes by a lot of names. Log odds, logit uh, are both acceptable. <clears throat> so same idea, um, just different expressions of the same model. We're going to see this uh, later in, in Poisson regression where there's multiple ways to say the same thing too. So, um, so for example, what might this look like in the real world? Um, here is the same example from the stratified analysis with MRSA earlier. Right here is MRSA is our outcome. It's one or zero. Um, and here's some stuff to control for previous hospitalization, age, sex, and uh, drug use, uh, antimicrobial drug use. So one model, this is one possible model, might look like this, where we include a single term for each x variable, and that's it. So, and then we have our, our alpha for our intercept, and these betas are the coefficients that we want to estimate that are multiplying each of those, um, uh, each of these zero, zero, one, or continuous variables here for age. So, this takes on only zero, one, sex takes on only zero, one, age can take on a whole range of stuff. So, this is one model that we might make, okay? And if imagine you had, um, Somebody, we're to call them X star, a person comes along and they were previously hospitalized um, and their age was 35 and they were sex 1 and PAMU1. Those get plugged in here and you're going to ask SAS to estimate 
for this person using some output, what you might ask what their probability of disease is. And it would look something like you'd plug in, you would plug this, you compute this equation, plug in some output from SAS for these, and you get an answer. You might also want to know well, what's the odds ratio in, the, in this model, what's the odds ratio for previous hospitalization comparing those who are hospitalized yes to no, controlling for all the other variables in this model? And the short answer to this is it's just e to the beta, all right, which is something you've seen before. Um, and it's just, and that is, that is derived from the logit form of the model, which we're not, we're, we're going to, I don't know if we're going to get there today. So, because we've got we to gotta go, all go home. Um, but, but we're going we're gonna to explain why this is, how we got here, and it's going to get really complicated. Um, and it's going to involve more variables. This is the easy way when there's no interaction. But when we start adding interaction terms, it's going to get a little less easy. But you're going to be, by the time we're done in the fall, by the end of the fall, you're going to be masters in all of this, and you're, you're going to be, you're going to be great. Thank you. <laughs>